Hello and welcome to India Business Hour. I'm Ashmit Kumar. Here are the headlines that we're tracking this evening. Infosys Q4, a shocker. The IT giant misses estimates on revenue and margins, lowers guidance for the ongoing fiscal sharply. Headcount declines for the fifth straight quarter. Net profit aided by other income comes above estimates. Strong domestic sales help Bajaj Auto in Q4. The company beats the street on all parameters, announces a dividend of 80 rupees per share. Market fails to hold on to opening gains. Nifty gives up on 22,000 levels, ends at its lowest closing level in a month. 38 out of 50 Nifty companies end in the red. BSE listed companies erase a market cap of more than 1 lakh crore rupees. Vodafone Ideas, much-awaited follow-on public offer, kicks off the cash-starved telecom company looking to raise 18,000 crore rupees. Marquee investors like GQG, Morgan Stanley and Fidelity back the FPO. Vodafone Ideas CEO Akshay Mundra tells CNBC TV18 that it sees gains from a shift to 4G driven by CapEx that the FPO will fund over the next three years. Nestle India says it has cut sugar content in certain infant products in India by up to 30% in the last five years. Clarifies on allegations that its baby food sold in certain South Asian, Latin American and African countries has more sugar than variants sold in Europe. Says its products in India meet WHO and local specifications. Tesla CEO Elon Musk scheduled to meet Prime Minister Modi and top business leaders during his 48-hour India visit starting Sunday. A meeting with startups to discuss opportunities in the space sector also on the cards. An announcement on Starlink's India entry is likely. Polling season officially kicks off tomorrow. Voting for 102 Lok Sabha seats across 21 states and union territories will take place. This is the largest of the seven phases. Polling will take place across all 39 Lok Sabha seats in Tamil Nadu and all five seats in Uttarakhand. The Supreme Court reserves its judgment on a plea seeking verification of all EVM votes with VVPAT slips, observes that one cannot be critical and suspicious of everything. However, asks the Election Commission to look into allegations of electronic voting machines registering extra votes for the BJP during Kerala mock polling. Tensions in West Asia flare up. Israel deploys extra artillery guns near Rafah, hinting at an imminent offensive. Qatar says it is re-evaluating its role as a mediator between Tel Aviv and Hamas. European Union leaders agree to increase sanctions against Iran after its attack on Israel. Well, let's begin with a quick look at the day's market action from the Lal Street. Now, the market failed to hold on to the opening gains. Nifty gave up on 22,000 levels, uh, ended its, at its lowest closing level in a month. 38 out of 50 Nifty companies ended in the red. The BSE listed companies raised market cap of more than 1 lakh crore rupees during this trading session. Well, speaking of the markets, let's focus in, let's home in on the earnings season. The big earnings of the day, the IT giant Infosys announced a shocker of an earnings, missing estimates on revenue as well as margins. The company has lowered guidance for the ongoing fiscal sharply. Strong deal wins uh, were the only solace. Reema Tendulkar now joining us uh, to decode these numbers. Reema, tell us, uh, take us through these earnings. Infosys has reported a shocker in Q4, much lower than street expectations, both on the top line and on the margin. The company's revenues have declined by 2.2% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, much lower than expectations, and revenues have now deteriorated for the second consecutive quarter. Margins versus expectations of an expansion have actually fallen 40 basis points. And now, even if you compare it with its closest peer, TCS, Infi numbers fall short. Um, you know, TCS had reported an over 1% revenue growth compared to Infi, which has reported a drop of 2%. And even on margins, TCS had managed to positively surprise the street with a margin expansion. But what's not going to go down well?
well with um, Infi this time, an investor, is the guidance for FI25. The company is guiding for a just 1% to 3% revenue growth, lower than consensus expectations of 3 to 5%, which basically means after reporting a 1.4% revenue growth in FI24, there is no big recovery in store. The management in the press conference says discretionary demand environment remains the same. Headcount for the company has fallen. Four, the number of uh, net employees are down more than 5,400. Attrition continues to moderate 12.6%. Deal wins for the company, though, are very strong, $4.5 billion in Q4. And for the full year, it's record deal wins seen by Infosys. But it's just not translating into a top-line growth as of now. The environment in terms of discretionary uh, and digital work is similar to what we've ended in this year. We also had uh, good traction in large deals, some of which uh, 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 will flow through in the next year, given the duration of those deals. Uh, keeping that in mind, our growth guidance for next year uh, is, as a band, higher than where we finished for this year. We see, for example, financial services to see uh, a better uh, outlook in the next year compared to the past year. Uh, we see, for example, manufacturing, which will have, while it'll still grow next year, will have a slightly lower, a slower growth than this year. Well, staying with earnings, Bajaj Auto posted a strong quarter, beating the estimates on all parameters. Net profit grew by 35%, while revenue rose 29%. The automaker's board also announced a dividend of 80 rupees per share. The profit was helped by strong domestic demand for Bajaj's motorcycles and a recovery in two-wheeler exports. And HDFC Life posted a week's set of numbers for the fourth quarter, missing its FY24 guidance on margins. The life insurer's value of new business fell over 18%, while total annualized premium equivalent for the quarter fell 8%. However, net profit grew by 15% year-on-year, Furthermore, HDFC Life's chairman and non-executive director Deepak Parikh has stepped down. Kiki Mystery will now take over as the chairman of the board. And cash staffed, uh, staffed Vodafone Ideas 18,000 crore rupee follow-on public offer kicked off today. The FPO is backed by marquee investors like GQG, Morgan Stanley and Fidelity. Speaking to CNBC TV 18, Vodafone Ideas CEO Akshay Mundra said that the funds will be used for growth and capital expenditure. He added that the payments for vendors as well as its government obligations will be made out of internal accruals. New funding is largely for growth capex and <laughs> our plan to meet the existing debt vendor payments and the government obligation is out of internal accruals. Now, of course, we expect the internal accruals to improve as we make investments. The only thing I would say is that you are aware of the reforms package and the reforms package has a provision that post the moratorium, the deferred installment series which is there, the convert, government can convert that to equity. So I think this is somewhat into the future. Uh, probably we will need government support for some time, but over a long period of time we believe that our operations should be sufficient to meet these obligations. And Nestle India has clarified on a Swiss NGO report alleging that baby food sold by them in poor South Asian, Latin American and African countries contain higher sugar content than those in Europe. Now, the company has said that they have reduced levels of added sugar in India by 30% over the last five years. However, sources tell us that uh, the food regulator is examining this report. Nestle India stock has witnessed its worst intraday fall in three years. Manglam Malu now joins us with more details. Manglam, what does this mean for the FMCG giant now? Nestle was lower in today's trading session and that's largely because of an important report that was made public during the holiday. That report was from Public Eye Investigation that spoke about the presence of sugar in their infant nutrition products, Cerelac. Now, it wasn't just the mere presence of added sugar, which is not considered good for health already in the product, but it was the disparity between the presence of sugar in some geographies versus none in some geographies. So, for instance, countries like Ethiopia and Thailand had the presence of almost 5 to 6 grams of added sugar per serving of the Cerelac wheat product. And for India and Pakistan, it was anywhere between 2 to 3 grams. 
whereas the same for developed economies or developed countries like UK and Germany was zero grams. So this disparity is something that the street is a little worried about. Why is it that some countries have no sugar, whereas some have the presence of sugar, which is not considered to be healthy, especially for infant nutrition itself. On its part, the company said that they work towards reducing the presence of added sugar in their India infant product by almost 30% in the last five years, and they're constantly working, renovating and uh, you know reformulating their products to be tasty as well as healthy while being in uh, you know uh, meeting the standards by the WHO and the local authorities as well but having said that could this issue be a bigger one why there is any disparity i mean if there is already a product in the world which has no sugar then why not simply bring that to india you know milk and nutrition products account for nearly 40% of nestle's overall sales which of course has a wide portfolio, but assuming that nearly half of that comes in from infant nutrition, that's 20% of Maggie's sales, which may have added sugar and which may have now been looked at with skepticism by the consumers itself. And Nestle's leadership in this space brings about a sense of doubt among all its customers. Well, Tesla CEO Elon Musk is set to visit India over the weekend. Sources tell us that the 2 to $3 billion India investment announcement is expected. Elon Musk is scheduled to meet the Prime Minister Modi on uh, Monday. Meetings with business leaders, startups and other government officials is also on the cards. Uh, Parikshit Lutra joining us now with more details. Parikshit, uh, what is Musk's India agenda and what kind of announcements are we expecting? Well, amid uh, declining sales for Tesla and softening of EV demand globally, it would be interesting to see Elon Musk's India plans. Uh, in addition to China, he would be hoping that India is a market that he could leverage. Uh, he would be meeting the Prime Minister on Monday morning, following which he is expected to make an announcement on entering the India market, importing cars into India from Germany, a whale of the new EV policy concessions, and maybe start manufacturing in uh, three years from now. Uh, Tesla teams are currently scouting for locations within the country. Having said that, there will be a detailed meeting that will take place with uh, EV startups in uh, with the space startups in New Delhi, and this is, will be the likes of Bellatrix, Agni Cool, uh, Skyroot, uh, Static. So there will be a lot of startups who will interact, and we could see an announcement on the space sector as well on Starlink. Starlink has been trying to bring. Uh, satellite-based broadband connectivity into the India market for a few years, and we believe that uh, the regulatory decks for them have uh, almost been cleared. So let's see if he makes an announcement on that front. There will be a family angle to this visit as well, because Elon Musk is uh, likely to come with his two children, and they could be visiting Agra as well. This leg of the visit is uh, yet to be finalized, but uh, the entire automobile sector is watching this move very closely. Even the component sector, because Tesla in the next few years will also increase local sourcing from India, from companies like Tata Electronics and also automobile component manufacturers for its plants in Berlin and Fremont. Right, Parikshit, thanks a lot for that. Elon Musk calling on India. Well, my colleague Lakshman Roy caught up with the finance minister, Nirmala Sitaraman, and asked her what she makes of Tesla's plans to make in India. Listen in to what, he, what she had to say. We welcome that please come to manufacturing in India because the environment is very cool. Our young and qualified skilled people can contribute. और सस्ते में भारत में सब फैसिलिटी मिलता है इसीलिए हम तो खुले आम सबको इनवाइट कर रहे हैं प्लीज कम एंड मैन्युफैक्चर इन इंडिया मैं एक बड़ा सा कंपनी भारत में आकर मैन्युफैक्चरिंग का इंटरेस्ट अगर दिखाते हैं उससे इंडिया का मैन्युफैक्चरिंग एनवायरनमेंट एक अच्छा संदेश मिलता है कि हां भारत में हाई टेक्नोलॉजी से जुड़े हुए बड़े कंपनियां आकर इंटरेस्ट दिखा रहे हैं मतलब हमारी पॉलिसी ठीक है हमारे मैन्युफैक्चरिंग वातावरण अनुकूल है और इसमें भारत का भी उपयोग है विदेश में भी एक्सपोर्ट कर सकते हैं। Well, here's the big global story. Tensions in West Asia continue to flare up. At least 18 persons were injured yesterday after Lebanon-based group Hezbollah hit northern Israel with drones. In response, Israel has said that its fighter jets struck Hezbollah targets in southern Lebanon. The Israeli army has also claimed to have killed and arrested several militants in northern eastern Gaza. The IDF has reportedly also deployed extra artillery and armoured personnel carriers, suggesting its preparation for the long-threatened ground offensive on Rafah. 
European Union leaders have agreed to impose new sanctions against Iran's drone and missile producers following Tehran's drone attack against Israel. Meanwhile, Qatar has said that it is reassessing its role as a mediator between Israel and Hamas. The Qatari Prime Minister said that its efforts are being undermined by unnamed politicians seeking to score points. The United Nations Relief and Works Agency has said that its campaign to end its operation in Gaza is ongoing. The chief of the UN agency warned Israel that there would be dismantle its humanitarian efforts. Well, time now for a short break, but coming up, a polling season officially kicks off tomorrow. Voting for 102 Lok Sabha seats across 21 states and union territories will take place. This is the largest of the seven phases. Details when we come back. Welcome back. Now, the big national story here. Polling for Lok Sabha elections kickstarts in less than 12 hours. Voting will be held for 102 constituencies in the first phase. Now, there are nearly 17 eligible lakh voters across 21 states and union territories. Now, voting will also be held for assembly seats in the state elections in Arunachal Pradesh and Sikkim. Eight seats in western Uttar Pradesh uh, go to elections as well. Uh, the BJP had won three of them in 2019. The Bahujan Samaj Party and Samajwadi Party won the remaining three and two seats respectively. BJP's Jitin Pasada from Pilibit and Union Minister Sanjeev Palyan from Muzaffarnagar will be the prominent candidates. Five constituencies in Maharashtra's Vidarbha region will also be voting. Veteran BJP leader and Union Minister Nitin Gadkari and Congress's Vikas Thakre will face off in Nagpur. All seats in Uttarakhand will also vote. But the big battle will be witnessed in Tamil Nadu where all 39 seats will be polling. Jude Sanit with his preview from Chennai. With just a day to go for phase one of polling, Tamil Nadu is a significant battleground simply because 39 out of 39 constituencies here will pay the poll booth a visit with multiple issues and multiple interesting personalities at the hem of things. First up, the BJP state president in K. Anamale is contesting his first ever Lok Sabha election from the constituency of Coimbatore, a recent BJP stronghold. But it won't be easy. And that's because the BJP's recent ally in the AIA DMK is contesting alone, which means 
joint votes for both the BJP and the AIADMK, which have been a feature of elections past, will not quite be the case, even as splitting of votes is likely to take place between the Saffron Party and the AIADMK itself. The DMK, remember, is all to defend 38 out of the 39 seats it occupies in Tamil Nadu, with multiple issues like relief, uh, uh, financial funding, and of course, uh, you know, infrastructure issues like the Chennai Metro Rail at the hem of things, really. Remember, the DMK has been accusing the BJP and the centre of not adequately funding infrastructure in Tamil Nadu, like the Chennai Metro Rail, or not coughing out any money for flood relief by way of Cyclone Mishong that happened in December last year. But remember, it's a key poll battle largely because the anti-incumbency factor will weigh in heavily on both the DMK and the BJP. And I say both parties because the BJP being at the centre is experiencing some anti-incumbency the DMK claims from the state of Tamil Nadu, while the BJP on the other hand says the voter here will want to bid the DMK goodbye given the fact that it's been ruling Tamil Nadu for the close to three years now. So which anti-incumbency, state or centre, will weigh in more on the voter? I guess we'll know in a few weeks from now. Well, phase one is the largest when it comes to the number of constituencies going to elections. Two out of the 102 UP for polling are newly created constituencies. That's uh, Kaziranga and uh, Sonitpur. Over 18 lakh polling officials across uh, close to 2 lakh polling stations have been deployed for nearly 17 crore eligible voters. Of them, around 35 lakh are new voters. Karur in Tamil Nadu has the highest number of candidates in the electoral fray. That number stands at 54 Debrugar, where Union Minister uh, Sabananda Sonowal is contesting, has the lowest number of candidates, only three. The Congress-headed uh, UPA had won 45 of the seats going to elections tomorrow. In 2019, BJP-led National Democratic Alliance had won 42 seats. And while the Supreme Court has reserved its judgment on a plea seeking 100% verification of VV Pats for elections, the court said that petitioners cannot be critical and suspicious of everything and added that increasing voter turnout shows public's faith in the electronic voting machines. Now, these comments followed uh, of submissions that were made by the Election Commission. Uh, the Election Commission, uh, to begin with, has trashed the suggestion that have, was made by the petitioners that VV Pat receipts need to be handed over to the persons in question, to the voters in question. The Election Commission raised two red flags. Number one said that uh, one can only imagine the mischief that can be created once these receipts are allowed to go outside the polling booth. That's one. Then the second concern that the Election Commission raised is that handing over these receipts will then raise questions about the secrecy of the entire voting exercise. Not just that, the Election Commission was... ...and these... Uh, uh, Suggestions and allegations regarding uh, the operation of EVMs coming at this stage, saying that a lot of times the timing of these arguments and allegations is designed, is meant in a way that will defeat the electoral process, that will undermine this electoral process. And finally, uh, the Election Commission also said that over the last very, very many years, over four crore VVPAT receipts have been matched and not a single case, not a single incident of a mismatch has come to light, has surfaced and therefore... The current system which is in place is safe, is secure and should be proceeded with as per current status quo. Now, uh, importantly, the Apex Court has reserved its judgment. Uh, all eyes now on the top court to give clarity uh, whether or not there is any modification required to the current VVPAT scheme, whether receipts need to be given, whether there needs to be an increase in the number of VVPAT verification. All of those aspects the Apex Court will now have to, have to dwell on and give its final judgment. Uh, but that, of course, is for a later date. For now, let's shift our focus on CNBC TV 18's future female forward, the Leadership Circle, a transformative platform where women leaders come together to connect, to express and to evolve. Speaking to my colleague Shireen Bhan, ace fashion designer Masaba Gupta explained why she named her recently launched makeup brand Love and Child and why it was a part of her efforts to destigmatize the term. She also added that it is an interesting time for Indian designers to do set up shop and do business here in India. When I saw Love Child, you know, it made me smile because for me it was it was a woman who was taking control of her life, who was reclaiming, reclaiming her identity. Did, did you think about it that way? Absolutely, because you know what happened was, I'll tell you how Love Child was born. The name first came to me because I remember I did uh, a very deep interview about my work with a very senior journalist in Delhi. And I remember reading it 
and the introduction said Masaba Gupta, the love child of Nina and Viv. And then I said, that's interesting. And, and where's the rest? Do I do anything else? Or am I just a love child, you know? And then I read up all the interviews that had happened before that. Majority of them introduced me like that. And there was one where there was a magazine cover where I looked very sad, like I had just cried or something. And the headline was the love and longing of love children. And it was my face and Pratik Babbar's face. I'll never forget. And I said, wow, this is really what people think. No matter what you do as a woman, you're sort of put in this box. Maybe not a man-woman thing also, really, yeah. Shireen. I think yeah. it's across the board. Um, I think it happens to everyone. And I said, you know what? They seem to really like that term. The press really likes that term. So let me turn it on its head and give them a brand out of it. Where do you see the House of Masaba over the next five years? The next five years, wow. I hope there's no other wave of something that we didn't see coming like it did. But, um, well, definitely we will have a much stronger retail footprint across India and globally. Um, we're currently at about 17 stores across India. The plan is to go to about 35 to 40 in the next couple of years. Mm. And uh, apart from that, we have lots of interesting category exten extensions planned, like I told you. So we are moving slowly but surely into the luxury space because I think India has become so dynamic right now. And I used to keep saying this. I said, you know, people like to go to the West and for them they feel happy when they open a store in New York or in Dubai. And I, I'm so happy with Khan Market. <laughs> I am thrilled when I get a I'm store sure at Khan Market. Khan Market is very happy with you being there as well. <laughs> oh, I love it. And I, you know, or Meroli or, or Kala Ghoda for that matter. Or, you know, Tadar Nawaz Khan Road in Chennai. For me, these are, these are the spots where India is really, really, it's booming. Mm. You know, and um, you look at the whole sort of population under 35 that has just about come into money and they're getting their first paychecks, etc. And they're all, also some of them founders. It is such an interesting time to be in India and to do business in India. Well, with that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Business R. Thank you so much for watching news and updates continue right here on CNBC TV 18.